Now guys, you're probably looking at the piece of code on my screen and asking yourself, what's wrong with this? Well, this piece of code is perfectly fine if performance is not one of your top considerations. But if it is, then this code is anything but ideal. All right. What is up my disciples, Coding Jesus here. If you're new to this channel, welcome. My name is Coding Jesus, and I am a quantitative developer, meaning I write server and client-side applications for traders at the firm that I work at. Now guys, today's video is going to be five ways that quantitative developers speed up their code. Now, what I'm not going to be talking about today is writing clean code. That's an assumption. That is a given. That should happen before we even consider the following five various methods that quantitative developers use to increase the speed of their code. I'm also not going to be talking about any sorts of external hardware above and beyond what's available in a computer. So I'm not going to be talking about FPGAs, et cetera, et cetera. Alrighty, guys, let's get into the first point. The first point that I would like to discuss is the stack versus the heap. And in particular, make sure to use the stack as much as possible and avoid the new keyword or avoid using unique or shared pointers. Now, why is that so important, guys? Well, newing up objects takes time and freeing them might take even more time. Let me explain. In any programming language, we have the stack and the heap. The stack is local, the heap is shared amongst multiple threads. Now guys, let's first understand how this stack works. The stack is a location in which we place local variables that are added to the stack in a LIFO fashion. In the sense that the last person to be added to the stack is the first one that is removed when the stack is unwound. Now adding an item to the stack is a simple operation. It's simply incrementing a pointer, incrementing the end pointer of a stack. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say we have A, B, and C on the stack. Now we want to add D. What happens when we add D? Well, all that happens is the last pointer to the pointer in this A, B, C, so the pointer pointing to C, is simply incremented to pointing to D. That is a very short and simple operation. Now let's kind of get an intuitive understanding for what happens when we try to add a D object to the heap. Let's say we have A, B, and C allocated on the heap, on the free store. Now let's say we go ahead and delete B. In a stack, you can't unwind things from some sort of random location. You can't get rid of B before you get rid of C. You have to go get rid of C, then B, then A. But on a heap, you can get rid of B, and then A, and then C, or C, and then B, and then A. It really all depends on what the programmer first calls delete on. So let's say we deleted B. Now we have a hole in the heap, meaning we have A, a massive hole of memory, and C. Let's say we want to new or allocate D up, okay? What actually ends up happening? Well, what happens is that there is a memory allocation algorithm that searches throughout the heap for a continuous chunk of memory in which a D can be placed in. Now, this takes a lot more time in comparison to simply incrementing a pointer as we discussed when we were focusing on the stack. The next thing I want to talk about is something called short circuiting. Now, short circuiting is a concept that's quite well known in the quantitative developer community, but for some reason, a lot of the developers that I talk to aren't so familiar with this concept. Now, short circuiting involves skipping over extra steps that had you continued with those extra steps would have otherwise led to the exact same conclusion. And guys, this is often used in the context of if statements or conditionals, but it doesn't have to be. Let's first understand the difference between the logical or and logical and operators before we actually bring up an example of short circuiting. In programming, the logical AND operator works as such. If the left-hand side of the AND is true and the right-hand side of the AND is true, then the expression is true. Conversely, the logical OR operator works as such. If either the left-hand side is true or the right-hand side is true, then the expression evaluates to true. Now, there is room for optimization here. You don't need to evaluate all expressions in this if statement, for example, let's say A and B. You don't need to evaluate B if A is false. Now, why is that the case? Well, if A is false, then it doesn't matter what B is, the entire expression will evaluate to false. And that's what the actual program will do. That's how it will optimize away the evaluation of B. And that's what short-circuiting uh, B is. So how do quantitative developers actually use this to increase the speed of their code? Well, you might have A, which is a cheap calculation or a cheap expression to evaluate. Then you have B, which is a much more expensive computation to perform and takes a lot longer. A quantitative developer will first put A and then put B to the right-hand side of the logical AND operator. That way, if the cheap check is true, 
B will be evaluated. But if the cheap check is false, there's no point in going ahead and evaluating that B expression because it's expensive and time consuming. The same thing happens for the logical OR operator. All right, the logical OR operator can also short circuit, but it does it a little differently. You want to put the cheap check first in the exact same way that you want to put the cheap check first in the logical AND operator. But instead of looking for the first expression to evaluate to false as it does in the logical AND operator to short circuit, the logical OR operator will short circuit if the first expression evaluates to true. The next thing that quantitative developers will do in order to increase the speed of their applications is that they will try to minimize the amount of branches that they have in their code. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a branch is an instruction that tells the CPU to deviate away from the instructions that it currently has in cache and go ahead and fetch instructions somewhere else. Now, those instructions might be in level two cache, level three cache, or they might even be in random access memory or RAM. Now, this operation is expensive because going ahead and fetching instructions somewhere else takes a lot of time. Now, a branch is, all, is often associated with an if-else conditional. For example, if this, or that, or that, or that, else do this, right? So that's a branch. Now, the CPU cannot accurately predict which branch that this if-else conditional is going to resolve to. Will it resolve to the first else if, the second else if, the third else if? It's not too sure. Now, the CPU will do its best job to try to predict which branch this if-else will resolve to, but if it predicts poorly, that's called a cache miss. It needs to go ahead and fetch a separate set of instructions that it hasn't already preloaded. Now, guys, you're probably looking at the piece of code on my screen and asking yourself, what's wrong with this? Well, this piece of code is perfectly fine if performance is not one of your top considerations. But if it is, then this code is anything but ideal, all right? This code involves a lot of checks, and it makes it hard for the branch predictor to predict which set of instructions it's going to need to pull to execute momentarily. Now, there are two better ways to do this. The first is good, and the second is even better. The first way to do this involves returning some sort of either optional or tuple from the method that you want to call. Let's say you want to write to a file and you want to return a tuple, okay? The first argument in this tuple is going to be a Boolean value indicating if there was an error in writing to the file. And the second is going to be the actual error code. This simplifies your if else conditional entirely. Instead of tens of dozens of else ifs to do checking for various errors, all you really need to do is check if there's an error, and if there is, go ahead and handle it. If there isn't, then just simply continue code execution. Now, there's probably an even better way to do this, and that way involves simply using a single integer as opposed to a tuple or some sort of other data structure like a std optional. All right, why would we use an integer? Well, we, we're going to use an integer because an integer is going to store our error code in bits inside the integer. So for example, a 32-bit integer will have its most significant bit turned on if some sort of error happens. It's going to have its second most significant bit turned on if a different error occurs in this write to file method. That way, if there are no errors, then there is nothing in this integer and it is simply zero. Now, the key to this, the key to why this is better than the previous approach is that computers are very good at handling ones and zeros, in particular zeros. Every CPU has an arithmetic logic unit, and that logic unit is very, very good at handling zeros. Hence, this approach, when we use an integer to simply encapsulate error codes, is not only better for the CPU, but it also condenses other data structures like needing to use a stud optional or using a tuple into a single integer. The next thing that quantitative developers will do, or rather it's something that they don't do because doing so would slow down their code, is they will not use polymorphism, meaning they will stay away from virtual methods, inheritance from classes that are abstract, et cetera, et cetera. They want to stay away from dynamic dispatch. All right, why will they do so? Well, there's really two reasons. The first reason is a little more simple. Virtual methods cannot be inlined. Inlining a method not only means that the function calls a lot faster, but also it comes at the cost of a larger binary. Virtual methods cannot be inlined, hence they can't take advantage of the speed that comes with inlining a method. The more important reason is the second reason. The reason is that a CPU cannot accurately predict the target of a virtual method during runtime. Now, like I mentioned before, guys, a CPU will prefetch instructions in anticipation of what it needs to execute. Now, it will only really know the target of a virtual method 
at runtime, meaning it might prefetch a given instruction set, but that instruction set is incorrect because it can't resolve the target until it gets to that instruction. So it prefetched a lot of instructions that it now doesn't need. What it will then need to do is discard these instructions and go look for the correct instructions that are associated with the target of that virtual method. All right, that might take a lot of time. It has to discard those instructions. It has to then look for those instructions in L1, L2, L3 cache, and it might not even find them there. It might need to go to RAM, which is very, very time consuming. So quantitative developers will stay away from polymorphism. Now that doesn't mean that they stay away from all polymorphism. They stay away from dynamic polymorphism. There is another concept that involves templates called static polymorphism. Now static polymorphism shifts the cost of resolving the target of a given method call, of that virtual method call from runtime to compile time. So instead of having a V table that has its own memory allocation that we need to store and then having the target resolved at runtime, the actual target is resolved at compile time. Now you're probably asking, is that a superior form of polymorphism? Is static polymorphism superior to dynamic polymorphism because there's no runtime cost? Well, guys, there's no free lunch. Static polymorphism comes with a cost, and that cost is a larger binary because of the template code that the compiler needs to now parse and therefore generate. So if you're interested in static polymorphism in contrast to dynamic polymorphism, you can take a look at a great YouTuber's video called Bochian. I'll put a thumbnail right here, and I'll also put a link to his video in the description box below. The final point that I wanted to talk about, guys, is keeping your cache warm. Now, what does it mean to keep your cache warm? Keeping your cache warm involves making sure that you have the lowest amount of cache misses possible. And so a cache miss is very costly. Now, how do we solve this? Well, we solve it by warming up the cache via something called a dummy step in an algorithm. Warming up the cache means that we have all the instructions that we need to execute very close to the CPU, either an L1 cache or L2 cache, meaning we don't need to make the great trek all the way to random access memory. Now that dummy step in the algorithm really helps us, and this is what the dummy step looks like. Let's say that we have a while loop that goes ahead and executes an algorithm. Fetch market data is step A, decode the market data is step B, format a message is step C, input the fields you need into the message in step D. And the last part of this algorithm is a dummy step, step E, which involves either sending the message or not sending the message. Now this algorithm runs in a while loop, meaning 99% of the time, the actual step E will be false. It's executing the same instructions over and over and over and over and over and over again. And 99% of the time, you won't actually need to send this message, but you're training your CPU to continuously go through step A, B, C, D, and E. This helps train the branch predictor of the CPU, and it makes sure that the instructions that you need are as close as possible to the CPU, meaning that they are in L1 cache. Why is that the case? Well, if the CPU is doing the same thing over and over and over again, then those same set of instructions are most likely going to be very close to the CPU in L1 or L2 cache. That's what's that is what is called keeping your cache warm. Now, there's a whole advanced section of keeping your cache warm called processor affinity, which involves reserving a CPU to just execute one task or one process. That is the uh, content for another video. And that is the end of this video. So processor affinity will not be in this video, but it will mark the end of the video. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and share this video. Make sure to subscribe if you learned something and make sure to share this video with friends if you'd like them to learn the same thing that you just learned today. I have a link in the description box below for my Discord, my Calendly if you'd like to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. I also have my email in the link in the description box below. And guys, if you'd like to become a patron, my Patreon link is in the description box below. Patrons are the lifeblood of this community and I will appreciate it entirely if you become a patron. You get access to a lot of exclusive perks. Thanks for watching the video, guys. Cheers.